Welcome back to Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. Where we produce and develop the highest quality gaming research in podcast form. I'm your host, Alex Kendall. And I'm your host, Derek Baker. And today, we are taking it back to the wacky, wacky mid-90s, to the launch of the PlayStation 1, and their seeking out or sought out mascot that no one really wanted or asked (laughs) for, but it came about. Yeah, I don't know that they sought out this mascot, but it became an undeniable face for the PlayStation. Obviously, today we're talking about Crash Bandicoot, who still sticks around, still very recognizable. I have about, I don't know, 15 friends on PlayStation that use this guy's face as an avatar. That's far too many. You guys need to update. (laughs) But uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk about this episode today with you. Yeah, and if... if you guys don't know Crash didn't grow up with it. I mean, he's quintessential as far as what as much as Sonic is, as much as Mario, as much as well. kind of Master Chief in those realms, at least for a mascot idea of it. Not the same echelon. Let's put that out there right now. However, when you think of PlayStation, you probably either think of Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, or even like some modern ones, possibly like, you know, Drake's Uncharted and there's a couple characters from oh, that. Yeah. But for the most part, as the cartooniness and kind of like bringing the badassery or kind of like the bad boyness to the PlayStation, definitely Naughty Dog with Crash Bandicoot. Yeah, Crash, I mean, it's something to me that uh, you see Crash Bandicoot immediately associated, I think, with those early PlayStation days. I'm thinking back to that old gray PS1 that's kind of mm-hmm. like a little sketchy looking device in the corner of a room. To me, it might be the beloved home entertainment console for your family. Probably just depends on what you had growing up, but Crash Bandicoot, obviously a very interesting platformer game. There's some things that I liked about it and some things that I didn't, but Mm -hmm. let's go ahead and get into it. Crash Bandicoot is a 1996 platformer developed by Naughty Dog and published by Sony Computer Entertainment for the PlayStation. The game's premise chronicles the creation of the beloved Crash, a bandicoot who has been uplifted by the mad scientist Dr. Neo Cortex. The story follows Crash as he aims to prevent Cortex's plans for world domination and rescue his girlfriend, Tana, a female bandicoot also created by Cortex. The game is played from a third-person perspective in which the camera trails behind Crash, though some levels showcase forward-scrolling and side-scrolling perspectives. Crash Bandicoot was released to generally positive reviews from critics, who praised the game's graphics, presentation, audio, difficulty level, and title character, but criticized its linearity and lack of innovation as a platform game. The game went on to sell over 6 million units, making it one of the best-selling PlayStation games. For the game's Japanese release, the gameplay and aesthetics underwent extensive retooling to make the game more palatable for Japanese audiences, and as a result, it became the first Western game to achieve commercial success in Japan. Crash Bandicoot became the first installment in a series of games that would achieve critical and commercial success and establish Naughty Dog's reputation in the video game industry. And we even see that today with Nathan Drake, uh, you know, within Drake's Uncharted, uh, another Naughty Dog title and, and what they've really established in that, The Last of Us. I mean, so many different titles have come from this silly, you know, fun cartoon game into a lot of these serious story-driven heavily PlayStation-centric titles. So Jason Rubin and Andy Gavin met as preteens in 1982 at a weekend Hebrew school in Virginia. After they discovered a mutual interest in computers and video games, they began regularly discussing programming, game development, and game piracy during class. Having experimented with Lisp and C++, Rubin and Gavin teamed up with a friend, Mike Goyette, and founded JAM Software in 1984. The acronym JAM stood for Jason, Andy, and Mike. However, when Goya became disinterested in the work and did not contribute to JAM's operations, Ruben and Gavin bought back his share of the company, about $100, within months, and the acronym was redefined as Jason and Andy's Magic. Ruben and Gavin chose to create software for the Apple II and decided to create a skiing game for their second title. During production of the game, Gavin, well, he accidentally copied over this bootleg game, over the only copy 
of the skiing game that they had. <laughs> so Ruben, I did created... that with a few v- VHSs myself. Hey, so. listen, when you're when you're when you want to record some Nick tunes, you got to put that parent's wedding tape in on accident and just re-record over it. Sorry, mom and dad. <laughs> so to resolve this. Ruben then created a new skiing game called Ski Crazed, originally titled Ski Stud, within that weekend. Because the game played slowly, Gavin reprogrammed the game to play a bit quicker. The game was later picked up and published by Baudville, who bought the game from Jam Software for $250. Wow. And, you know, it got, obviously it got written over. That's a bummer, but we all know that that true ski game was the early windows one where the sasquatch yeti would come and eat you so Mm -hmm. they were already fighting a uphill battle when they thought they were fighting a downhill ski game fighting that yeti and in 1989 ruben and gavin released a game titled keef the thief which was published by electronic arts for the apple 2gs amiga and ibm pc compatible to make a fresh start and to dissolve their relationship with baudville Ruben and Gavin renamed Jam Software as Naughty Dog on September 9th, 1989. Naughty Dog also created and developed Rings of Power, which was published by EA for the Sega Genesis in 1991. Within that development, Ruben and Gavin were joined on the title by programmer Vijay Pandey, who would later become better known for orchestrating the Distributed Computing Disease Researching Project, known as Folding at Home at Stanford University. In 1994, Ruben and Gavin produced the 3DO interactive multiplayer title Way of the Warrior and presented it to Mark Cerny of Universal Interactive Studios. Cerny was pleased with Way of the Warrior and signed Naughty Dog onto Universal Interactive Studios for three additional games. Ruben and Gavin devised a plan to create a three-dimensional action platform game. Production of the game began in 1994, during which Naughty Dog expanded its number of employees and invented a development tool called Game-Oriented Object Lisp to create the characters and gameplay. Cartoonists Charles Zambias and Joe Pearson were recruited to create the characters of the game, which resulted in the titular character Crash Bandicoot. After 14 months of development, the game was shown to Sony Computer Entertainment who then signed on to publish the game. So obviously kind of an uh, interesting cycle, you know, very much kind of stole our thunder. Um, we had uh, a JAD Productions, a um, little Jake, Alex, Derek going on. That's right. Um, and I see Jam has stolen that, um, obviously before we created it, but they were forethought thinking and knew it would occur. So they made sure that that acronym of just three first names would solidify right yeah i get it they did come a little bit before us but they definitely stole the idea from us because time travel obviously and i'm glad that we're talking about this and that all that stuff i believe is wiped from the internet so that's good i'm glad (laughs) so you can't find it but we definitely made some weird youtube videos in high school (laughs) so when it comes to developing the game let's take it back to january 5th 1994 where mca inc executive vice president skip paul established Universal Interactive Studios, a division for developing and publishing video games in interactive software, in response to a film industry trend of studios opening similar divisions. With this development, Universal Interactive was eager to acquire independent developers with the intention of eventually using them to create games and interactive movies based on Universal's existing franchises. At that year's Winter Consumer Electronics Show, Naughty Dog's Andy Gavin and Jason Rubin displayed their latest game, Way of the Warrior, in search of a publisher and, by chance, their booth was situated in close proximity to that of Universal Interactive, where Mark Cerny and Rob Biniaz served as its representatives. A bidding war broke out between Universal, the 3DO company, and Crystal Dynamics for publishing rights of Naughty Dog's game. Universal Interactive won the game's publishing rights by offering Naughty Dog a place on their lot and funding for three additional games, over which Naughty Dog would have creative freedom. This atypical agreement ensured that Naughty Dog could be locked in long enough to create a product that met Universal Interactive's expectations. You know, being a new development company, they're just like, I don't know, snag them up, have them make some games. If we love them, perfect. If we don't, they've got a couple tries to go through. In August 1994, Gavin and Rubin began their move from Boston, Massachusetts to L.A., California. Before leaving, Gavin and Rubin hired Dave Baggett, 
their first employee and a friend of Gavin's from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where Baggett would not start working full-time until January 1995. During the trip, Gavin and Rubin studied arcade games intensely and noticed that racing, fighting, and shooting games had begun making a transition into full 3D rendering. They initially considered a 3D beat-em-up based on Final Fight, before recognizing that their favorite video game genre, the character-based action platform game, had no 3D games at this point. Donkey Kong Country was particularly influential in stirring the pair's curiosity as to how such a game could function in three dimensions. They figured that in a 3D perspective, the player would be constantly looking at the character's back rather than their profile, and thus jokingly called the hypothetical project Sonic's Ass Game. The basic technology for the game and the Crash Bandicoot series as a whole was created somewhere near Gary, Indiana, and the rough game theory was designed near Colorado. Soon afterward, Gavin and Rubin discarded a design for Al Osaurus and Deanstein, or Dynastine, a side-scrolling video game based on time travel and scientists genetically merged with dinosaurs. Which I am infinitely curious about right now. Deanstein, Dynastein. You, you give me some punny names like Allosaurus, I'm in. Allosaurus, I think I've met a man with that name once. <laughs> Naughty Dog met with Cerny after moving into their new Universal City, California offices. The group unanimously liked the Sonic's ass game idea and discussed what video game system to develop it for. Deciding that the 3DO, Atari Jaguar, Sega 32X, and Sega Saturn were unsatisfactory options due to poor sales and development units they deemed to be clunky, the team ultimately chose to develop the game for Sony's PlayStation. Considering the company and console sexy, the team focused on the company's lack of an existing competing mascot character. After signing a developer agreement with Sony, Naughty Dog paid $35,000 for a PlayStation development unit and received the unit in September 1994. A development budget of $1.7 million was set for the game, and production began in October 1994. Ruben and Gavin were the 44th and 45th individual developers to sign on to development for the PlayStation, and according to Ruben's approximation, Crash Bandicoot was the 30th game to begin development for the PlayStation. David Siller was assigned as the game's producer by Universal Interactive due to his expertise in game design, despite Gavin and Rubin's reluctance toward having a producer. For the game's lead character, Naughty Dog wanted to do what Sega and Warner Brothers did while designing their respective characters, Sonic the Hedgehog and the Tasmanian Devil, and incorporate an animal that was cute, real, and that no one really knew about. The team purchased a field guide on Tasmanian mammals and selected the Wombat, Batoru, and Bandicoot as options. Gavin and Rubin went with Willie the Wombat as a temporary name for the starring character of the game. So glad that they didn't stick with that. <laughs> yeah, very true. They never intended the name to be final, due both to the name sounding too dorky and to the existence of a non-video game property of the same name. The name was also used by Hudson Soft for its Japanese-exclusive Sega Saturn role-playing game, Willy Wombat. While the character was effectively a bandicoot, he was still referred to as Willy the Wombat, as a final name had not been formulated yet. The villain of the game was created while Gavin and Rubin were eating near Universal Interactive Studios. Gavin came up with the idea of an evil genius villain with a big head who was all about his attitude and his minions. Rubin, having become fond of the animated television series Pinky and the Brain, classic, mm -hmm. imagined a more malevolent version of the brain with minions resembling the weasel characters in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. After Gavin put on a voice depicting the attitude and mind for the character, he and Rubin instantly came up with the name Dr. Neocortex. I love how casually stuff like this happens. Like you think like, oh, it was a think tank for like this game or movie that this stuff happened. And they were legit just out, you know, having some burgies and some nachos. Be like, <laughs> what about this voice? <laughs> yep. You know what? Dr. Neocortex. I think that's what we got to go with. Those are where the best ideas come from, right? Where it's just you're mm -hmm. kind of sitting around making fun of something with your friends. And all of a sudden, hey, you're just going to run with it. It's going to be a thing forever. It's that idea of, you know, the bar napkin. Like you write your master business plan, like while you're at having a drink or two with a friend, sketching on that bar napkin, and that's where every company starts. 
It's either a garage or a bar. <laughs> <laughs> Following their previous experience with Way of the Warrior, Gavin and Ruben recognized that a large development team would be required to create their new game. As they settled into Universal Interactive's back lot, Gavin, Ruben, and Baggett befriended Taylor Kurosaki, a visual effects artist who was working on the television series Sequest DSV in the same building. Kurosaki, who had been using Lightwave 3D in his work, was attracted by the opportunity to learn and use Power Animator and became Naughty Dog's next employee on January 5th, 1995. Bob Rafai was also hired around this time and was assigned as the game's art director. Now, in March 1995, Universal Interactive and Naughty Dog recruited Joe Pearson of Epoch Inc. to aid in the visual aspect of production. Pearson, in turn, recommended that Charles Zambias of American Exodus be brought on board as well. Pearson and Zambias would meet with Naughty Dog weekly to create the characters and environments of the game. Because the main character was Tasmanian, it was decided that the game would take place on a mysterious island where every possible type of environment could be found with the added reasoning that an evil genius like Cortex would require an island stronghold. Pearson created a concept Bible that included detailed backstories for Crash and Cortex and established the game's setting as the remnants of the lost continent of Lumuria. Zambia's initial sketches of Crash depicted him as a squat, hunkered-down character. After Pearson drew a version of Crash that was leaner, had a larger nose, and wore a Zorro-like mask, Zambias began drawing Crash as a little more manic and insane. Naughty Dog decided early on that there would be no connection between a real animal and Crash's final design, which would instead be determined, quote, 51% by technical and visual necessity and 49% by inspiration. Gavin determined Crash's fur color by creating a list of popular characters and their colors and then making a list of earthly background possibilities such as forests, deserts, beaches, etc. Colors that would not look good on the screen were strictly outlawed, such as red, which would bleed on older televisions. And so orange was selected by process of elimination. Crash's head was made large and neckless to counter the low resolution of the screen and allow his facial expressions to be discernible. Ruben noted the increased difficulty in turning Crash's head with this type of design. Small details such as gloves, spots on Crash's back, and a light-colored chest were added to help the player determine what side of Crash was visible based on color. Crash was not given a tail or any flappy straps of clothing due to the PlayStation's inability to properly display such pixels without flickering. The length of Crash's pants was shortened to keep his ankles from flickering, as they would with longer pants. Crash was originally written as a speaking character who, as a result of his subjection to the Cortex Vortex, communicated in a series of bizarre non-sequiturs derived from classic literature and pop culture. The team ultimately decided that Crash would be mute because they considered passive voices for video game characters to be, quote, lame, negative, and distracting from identification with them. And I think that's a good decision because mm -hmm. you think about the Mario series, for instance where Mario just makes a lot of ho, 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 ha, ha, those mm -hmm. kinds of noises. And you still, you can associate with Mario. You're not Mario in that game, of course, like you are in yeah. some games with the silent protagonist, but I think that it, it helps uh, prevent distractions for sure. Well, and around this time too, it was like such an edgy time for games. Like you'd have Gex or like all these other games where they try to like have one-liners throughout the whole game. One, you don't have enough voice lines to last the whole game. And two, it's just so annoying. And all of those references die out within like a year. <laughs> so it's like, it makes no sense. So I'm so glad they went with that because it also allows you just to like play it and concentrate, not have like this annoying, like random non sequiturs or like voice lines of like Shakespeare jumping in randomly. Yeah, it doesn't, especially it doesn't work well for a game of this time i don't know it, it would have been harder i think to really fall in love with crash or use him as a mascot yeah. if that became like his thing it just pigeonholes you so much going into future projects and i don't know if that was their mentality necessarily going forward like we really want to continue with crash specifically mm -hmm. i mean maybe they had that idea a little bit and were hopeful that it would catch on like that but 
if you make that as thing, that would be exhausting to have to do yeah. for every future game. So I think it was a smart decision for sure. Well, exactly. I mean, if, if you look at official or unofficial, let's just throw in Mario, Master Chief, Sonic, and Crash. Sonic does talk in later games, but for the most part, between all of them, it's very minimal lines, if any. It's just to the point, and it gets to it. Now, obviously, with Sonic and Master Chief, they've both expanded on that in later games, but for those first ones, it was just quick, to the point, and allowed you to play. People love a silent protagonist. Mm-hmm. It's as simple as that. Gavin and Rubin described Cortex to Zambias as, quote, having a huge head but a tiny body. He's a mad scientist, and he dresses a bit like a Nazi, but from the Jetsons. Cortex was originally envisioned as a self-aware video game character who was bothered by the cliches he embodied and addressed the audience throughout the game. This aspect was removed after Naughty Dog decided that cutscenes would disrupt the game's pace. I think we've talked about that before, too, is like keeping cutscenes out to keep it in the game and keep it going. There are a couple, I will say that. We do get cutscenes in later Crash games, but for this to just kind of roll through and like to play the levels, it keeps that flow going. Absolutely. Aku Aku was originally conceived as an elderly human character who communicated through mumbles only, intelligible to Crash, in a manner similar to the dynamic between C-3PO and R2-D2 of Star Wars. His name originates from a Polynesian restaurant located near the Aloife Station, which featured giant tiki statues out front. The Aku Aku masks that protect Crash were a late addition intended to balance the gameplay's difficulty. Because Cerny's initial suggestion of a translucent shield would have been technically impractical, the floating masks were created as a low-polygon alternative. The character Ripperoo was created to humorously demonstrate the dangers of the Cortex Vortex, as well as provide an opportunity for Naughty Dog's animators to practice overlapping action. Papu Papu was designed to allow the team to animate jiggly fat. Pinstripe Potoru was inspired by the film The Godfather. Tana, originally named Carmen, was based on actress Pamela Anderson, though her design was scaled back to be less provocative. The Komodo Brothers and Tiny Tiger, who would appear as boss characters in future games in the series, were originally created for the first game. So a bunch of kind of one-off characters that they saved for later games and other arts that they had ready for it. And you could see that they're very tempted by the pop culture references here. Like they're oh, yeah. drawing a ton of inspiration from Hollywood. Obviously, they want to make these characters have fun names that are kind of just little plays on words, ripperoo, they have alliteration, things like that. And I'm glad that they left it really to the character naming and didn't mm -hmm. try and follow through with some of those narrative ideas. On creating the levels for the game, Pearson first sketched each environment, designing and creating additional individual elements later. Pearson aimed for an organic, overgrown look to the game and worked to completely avoid straight lines and 90-degree corners. A Naughty Dog artist sketched every single background object in the game before it was modeled. Naughty Dog's artists were tasked with making the best use of textures and reducing the amount of geometry. Dark and light elements were juxtaposed to create visual interest and separate geometry. The artists would squint when sketching, texturing, and playing the levels to make sure they could be played by light value alone. They ensured to use color correctly by choosing mutually accentuating colors as the theme for the Lost City and Sunset Vista levels. And the interior of Cortex's castle was designed to reflect his twisted mind. According to Rubin, the artists worked on the visuals for eight months before any game code was written. That's a very interesting strategy to, to squint. Yeah. And just to kind of see the light levels. And I know this was a very important thing. Uh, through an interview I was watching with him, he was basically saying that he wanted to make sure, going back to that 90 degrees, that the game always flowed. You didn't stop. You always kept moving and going. And to keep you on a linear path, while not feeling like a linear path, you know, using basically like vignetting or kind of like darkening the edges is kind of what they did to make you feel like in these jungles, in these snowy places, in these hot places, but to keep you. It, it was weird. It was weird. It's to keep you immersed, but also feel like you can explore. And I think that this style of game really becomes popular after the Crash series because mm -hmm. how many uh, platformer games in this 3D style are you in these very blocked off 90 degree angled situations? I, I feel like it's very few. Now, this one, mm -hmm. of course, was more path based and 
you know, point A to point B kind of situation where I think future platformers, like a, I'm thinking like a Mario 64, you're kind of all over the place. So it's a little bit different, a little bit more open worldy. But for a game like this, that's doing it this way, I think that it was a good decision to, to help those levels flow and to make it feel like you were in a little bit more of a, a jungle and not just a, a path that, you know, randomly took you on a hard left. And we're going to be talking about that that in a second but the major reason they're doing this is the playstation had such a terrible time eating away memory and just had such a poor memory consistency that they really did this to build these levels out to feel like there's so much on screen when in reality none of it's interactive it's just you know pngs and jpegs that are around that make you feel like you're in this environment production on crash bandicoot used a hundred thousand dollars of silicone graphics-based workstations with an IRIX-based tool pipeline rather than the $3,000 personal computers that were the standard at the time. The PlayStation had a 512 by 240 video mode, which used video memory normally reserved for textures, but was also efficient in rendering shaded polygons without texture. Ruben pointed out that since the polygons on the characters were just a few pixels in size, shaded characters would look better than textured ones. Thus, polygon counts were emphasized over textures, which allowed the programmers to bypass the PlayStation's lack of texture correction or polygon clipping. To make the game look like an animated cartoon, vertex animation was implemented rather than the standard skeletal animation with one joint weighting, allowing the programmers to use the more sophisticated three to four joint weighting available in Power Animator. Because the PlayStation was unable to calculate this in real time, the location of each vertex was stored in each frame at 30 frames per second. Gavin, Baggett, and Cerny attempted to invent a compressor and assembly language for this manner of animation. Cerny's version, although the most complicated, was the most successful of the three. The vertex animation method allowed Crash to display a much wider range of facial expressions than competing video game characters at the time. You know, you think back to the end of the level where Crash makes some kind of crazy big mouth thing Mm -hmm. i don't even know how to describe it necessarily but if you've seen it you know it those crazy big mouth things or like you know when it gets injured or squashed or like burnt up like it's all that caricature animation that we see like in you know a wily coyote cartoon but we're seeing on this character for the first time and going back to like not having a neck and kind of being very tasmanian devil where your face is your whole body it works really well with Crash to allow that mouth to drop to his knees, you know, to, to allow these like over the top Looney Tunes esque bits that we didn't even see. Going back to Mario 64, yeah, there's minimal animation we see in his face, but like next to nothing compared to what we're seeing here. Ruben created Crash's model with 532 polygons and animated all the game's characters. Because Cortex's legs were too short for his game model to walk properly, he was kept stationary in many of his appearances. To obtain the game's vast and detailed graphics, Ruben, Gavin, and Baggett researched visibility calculation in video games that followed Doom and concluded that extending the visibility pre-computations would allow the game to render a large number of polygons. Following experimentation in free-roaming camera control, the team settled with a branching rail camera that would follow along next to, behind, or in front of Crash, generally looking at him, thus moving on a track through the world. Since only 900 polygons could be visible on screen at a time, parts of the game's landscapes are hidden by trees, cliffs, walls, and twists and turns in the environment. Gavin created procedural textures to overcome the lack of available texture memory. Each level in Crash Bandicoot contains 6 to 8 megabytes of texture. Baggett created two-way compressors that would reduce the 128 megabyte levels down to 12 megabytes and allow them to be compatible with the PlayStation's 2 megabyte random access memory, or RAM. The levels proved to be so large that the first test level created could not be loaded into Power Animator and had to be cut up into 16 pieces. Each piece took about 10 minutes to load on a 256 megabyte machine. To remedy the situation, Baggett created the DLE, or Dave's Level Editor, a level design tool with which RGB values from a top-down map of a level are used to assemble level environments with a succession 
of 10 to 15 layers from Adobe Photoshop, indicating how the level's portions have to be combined. Rafi created nearly all of the game's backgrounds, which they use to kind of texture around, as we had said, that get hidden by those environments to hide those pixels and hide those polygons. Again, to summarize this, they basically had to kind of hack in to a lot of the PlayStation's just random access memory to make this game work because it should not have worked. A pair of cutscenes featuring hand-drawn animation were produced by Universal Animation Studios to serve as the game's intro and outro, as well as act as source material for a potential animated series if the game was well-received and commercially successful. The hand-drawn cutscenes were dropped after Sony Computer Entertainment picked up Crash Bandicoot for publication, as Sony desired to push the PlayStation's 3D polygonal graphics. The cutscenes were uploaded to YouTube by Siller in 2015, so you can check those out if you want. Naughty Dog made the early decision to design Crash Bandicoot as a classic action-based platform game as opposed to an open-world exploration-based game in order to fully render its environments in three dimensions. To code the characters of gameplay, Gavin and Baggett created the programming language Game-Oriented Object Lisp, or GOOL, G-O-O-L, using Lisp syntax. The first two levels created for the game were not integrated into the final version because they were too open and had too many polygons. During the summer of 1995, the team focused on creating levels that were both functional and fun and used the Cortex factory levels to experiment on this goal. The mechanical setting allowed the team to forego the complex and organic forest designs and distill the two-axis gameplay. The first two functional levels, Heavy Machinery and Generator Room, utilized 2.5D gameplay and featured basic techniques previously used in Donkey Kong Country, such as steam vents, drop platforms, bouncy pads, heated pipes, and enemy characters that would move back and forth, all arranged in increasingly difficult combinations as the level progresses. Crashes, jumping, and spinning attacks were refined in these two levels. The Cortex Power level incorporates the original Sonic's ass point of view, which is behind the character and over the shoulder, featured in the two test levels. After working on those three levels, the first operational jungle-themed level, Jungle Rollers, was created from pieces of the failed first test level arranged into a corridor between the trees. Afterward, two to three levels would be developed for each environmental theme created, with the first level featuring an introductory set of challenges and later levels adding new obstacles, such as dropping and moving platforms in the second jungle-themed level to increase the difficulty. The level layouts and gameplay mechanics were generally not drawn out on paper beforehand and were largely the result of trial and error by the Naughty Dog team. Siller created sketches and summaries to document the end result, but later used the documents to claim credit for the game's designs and mechanics. After developing the core gameplay, Naughty Dog realized that there were many empty areas in the game due to the PlayStation's inability to generate multiple enemies on screen. In an attempt to remedy this, they created the Wampa Fruit, which was an item in three dimensions by means of a series of textures, but this was not considered sufficiently exciting. On a Saturday, specifically on a Saturday in January 1996, Gavin and Rubin conceived the crate mechanic, reasoning that crates would be made up of low amounts of polygons and multiple types of which could be combined to interesting effect. Gavin coded the crates while Rubin modeled some basic crates as well as an exploding TNT crate and drew quick textures. The first crates were integrated into the game six hours later, and many more were placed during the following days. By February 1996, over 20 levels had been created, which were in various stages of completion. Kurosaki designed three quarters of the game's levels. One of the last levels he created was Stormy Ascent, which was roughly four times longer than the other levels. Although Stormy Ascent was fully playable, Naughty Dog deemed the level too difficult and lacked time to make it easier, and honestly decided to cut it from the game before submitting the gold master to Sony, or the final copy, to Sony. Because removing the level completely was considered too risky, Stormy Ascent was left hidden within the disc and accessible to play via GameShark. Stormy Ascent was later recreated by Vicarious Visions and released as downloadable content for the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy on July 20th, 2017. 
It's so funny how all these old games, they just had all this extra material that now as time has gone on, people have been able to access and see more of what's really hidden in some of these early coded games. Now, yeah, it's thank cool. goodness for Game Shark. I had so much fun using Game Shark back in the 90s on all kinds of various consoles, you know, hack mm-hmm. my Game Boy games or whatever else. So it was cool, I think, to be able to use something like that and, and get a game like this, even if it was at the risk of um, permanently damaging something within your console. Well, that was kind of like, uh, you know, most of you have mods now. You know, you have mod communities that build these mods to either, you know, make you infinite and you know, do this, this or that. But back then, Game Shark and Action Replay were kind of the two big names that allow you to Pokemon, get infinite rare candy, you know, in GoldenEye, be able to be invincible or get guns you weren't supposed to do or like this, access levels you're not supposed to. So those were always just so much fun to see the potential of it. You kind of felt like you were building your game within that game with those, like, like changing the entire gameplay of it. And cheat codes, unfortunately, really aren't a thing anymore. You know, we saw them a lot in like GTAs and a couple others would give you all the guns, infinite health, flying cars, all these other things. So back then, that's what you had. And so it's really cool to see that you can tap into so much of that. And people are even using that now today to make randomizers where you randomize where items are. You randomize, you know, where you can find health, what level you can jump into, whether it's, you know, again, Mario 64 or Ocarina of Time, just fully changing everything. It's kind of the new action replay, the new hidden level. Yeah, it's cool to see them just change one or two things within a reference code. And now all of a sudden you're playing a Pokemon game and the first Pokemon you encounter is like a level three Mewtwo or something like that. Mm -hmm. So very, very cool. Happy to see a Game Shark reference in this episode, Alex. You're really tickling me in the nostalgia button. Hey, that's what I'm here for. A, a Game Shark and a Gex reference all in one episode. Now, Derek, coming up, we're going to be talking about a bit more nostalgia, too, because we're jumping over to the marketing, and we grew up with it. Oh, man. I don't know They're if I can handle any more of this. They're interesting commercials, for sure. In September 1995, Andy Gavin and Taylor Kurosaki, using the latter's connections to the Sequest DSV crew, spent two days in the series editing bay creating a two-minute demo film and gave it to a friend who would show it to Sony Computer Entertainment. Sony appreciated the demonstration, but internal management issues meant that Sony would not sign an agreement with Universal Interactive to publish the game until March 1996. While preparing for the game's demonstration at the 1996 E3, the team decided to finally rename the title character Crash Bandicoot a name credited to Kurosaki and Dave Baggett. The character's name was based on a species and the visceral reaction to his destruction of boxes. The names Dash, Smash, and Bash were also considered. Could you imagine a Bash Bandicoot? A BB. A BB, BB. (laughs) Oh man, you're too quick for me. Universal Interactive's marketing director contested the name and objected to the character Tana for her perceived sexist nature. While Naughty Dog was able to retain the Crash Bandicoot name after threatening to leave production, they chose to omit Tana from subsequent entries in the series based both on this experience and to appease the desire of Sony's Japanese marketing team for a more girlish female supporting character. Universal Interactive, in an attempt to take credit for Crash Bandicoot, notified Naughty Dog that they were not allowed to attend E3. In addition, Leaked copies of the temporary box cover and press materials for E3 omitted the Naughty Dog logo in violation of the contract between Naughty Dog and Universal Interactive. In response to this provocation, Jason Rubin drafted and printed 1,000 copies of a document entitled Naughty Dog, Creator and Developer of Crash Bandicoot, to hand out in front of the Crash Bandicoot display at E3. I love hearing these stories from some of these, the Wild West of video gaming where it's so much of this small-time petty nonsense that's so good. I mean, obviously, Naughty Dog had a right to be upset about this, for sure. For sure. I mean, it's, it's in this weird turmoil where, like, the rights to publish are kind of up in the air, but Universal is kind of being hurt, being like, no, 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 no. You can't put your name on any of these Because things. it wasn't as big of... I mean, right now, the gaming industry is obviously a huge corporate machine. This is like these guys like we said, in the garage, at the bar, writing down the, their ideas mm-hmm. on napkins. And when it starts to get corporate, sometimes 
people that are like that don't necessarily know how to handle those situations. And going and printing a thousand copies of the Naughty Dog creator and developer of Crash Bandicoot documents, I think, is a, a perfect example of that. It's petty. It's funny. And it gets the point across. It's, it's, it's so sitcom-y, and I love it so oh, much. Oh, this is a George Costanza moment, for sure. <laughs> yes. It's so good, and I absolutely love this it. This is a Kramer, the man's ear kind of situation. Yeah. <laughs> Crash Bandicoot was first shown at E3 in May 1996 and was met with enthusiastic reactions. Crash Bandicoot was displayed at the front of Sony's booth at E3, replacing their original choice of Twisted Metal. Even though Crash is a little bit of a, you know, a BA, he's a rebel. Mm-hmm. Probably a much safer choice than Twisted Metal, which is super dark. And I'm still scared of it, <laughs> yeah. to be honest. No, hey, it's, it's the thing of like, hey, kids want this new console? I know Nintendo's got one, but look at ours. It's just fire and rockets um, and destruction going off with the twisted evil clown car on the front. Yeah. Great for children. <laughs> Absolutely. Ami Matsurimura Blair of Sony served as the marketing manager for Crash Bandicoot and worked in collaboration with Eric Moe and Chris Graves of TBWA Chiat Day to create the game's advertising campaign. Moe and Graves, recognizing that Sony sought to establish itself as a challenger to Nintendo, conceived the idea of Crash Bandicoot inspiring a crazed fan to create a Crash outfit and harass Mario from Nintendo's parking lot. The team set a rule against directly insinuating that the video game character and the costume person in the advertisement were the same individual, as the two entities had different personalities. As the marketing team went to Seattle to film the commercial, they created smaller teasers depicting the fan's journey to Nintendo. The commercial was shot near a Nintendo building, but not the main Nintendo headquarters, which Matsumura Blair felt aligned with the campaign's humor. She remarked that it, quote, would totally make sense that this guy hadn't done his homework and had mistakenly gone to the wrong building. An additional commercial featuring Sega was considered, but never created due to increasing expenses. And of course, Nintendo responded by years later, making the Lugia PT Cruiser. So... <laughs> exactly. And that's exactly it. So these commercials, I think for the Insane Trilogy, which came out in 2017, I believe they brought this idea back to advertise that for the trilogy of the first three of them, which is also pretty fantastic. <laughs> in summary, the development of Crash Bandicoot spanned a total of 18 months. It was released in North America on September 9th, 1996, in Europe on November 8th, 1996. The game is dedicated to Tae Min Kim, an actor from Way of the Warrior who was killed in a cycling accident in 1995. So that's very sad. Um, obviously, uh, a big part of Naughty Dog was the way of the warrior. Good that they decided to honor his memory that way. And it's very much like a protective family that they had with a lot of people that worked there. So you could see that being that, that honoree and, and really putting that there is, is really nice. And I mean, it shows the passion that they really had in those early days before commercializing and before kind of become this huge studio as most were even Bungie, like having that like very family esque feel to it. For sure. Now, let's move on to the meat and potatoes of this episode, I'd say. The, the thing that really put Crash Bandicoot apart from other games at the time, that is the gameplay. Mm -hmm. Crash Bandicoot is a platform game in which the player controls the character Crash, who is tasked with traversing 32 levels to defeat Dr. Neo Cortex and rescue Tana. The majority of the game takes place in a third-person perspective in which Crash moves into the screen. Certain levels that require him to flee from a rolling boulder reverse this perspective, while other levels are played from a traditional side-scrolling perspective. Crash is capable of moving in all directions, aside from moving left and right. He can move away from or toward the player, and the controls do not change with his position. His two primary forms of offense consist of jumping onto enemies and performing a spinning attack that kicks enemies off the screen. Kicked enemies can strike other enemies that are currently on screen. Two levels involve Crash mounting and steering a wild boar that accelerates uncontrollably, requiring him to maneuver around obstacles and bypass enemies. Scattered throughout each level are various types of crates that can be broken open by jumping on, spinning, or knocking a kicked enemy into them. 
Most crates contain Wumba fruit that can grant Crash an extra life if 100 are collected. Some crates display an icon of what they contain. Crates displaying Akuaku will grant Crash a floating Akuaku mask that protects him from a single enemy or hazard. Collecting three masks consecutively grants Crash temporary invulnerability from all minor dangers. Crates marked with a C act as checkpoints where Crash can respawn after losing a life. Metallic crates marked with an exclamation point cause an enemy of the surrounding environment to change if they are struck. Jumping on red TNT crates triggers a three-second timer that culminates in an explosion while spinning into them causes an immediate detonation. And so you can see a lot of the Donkey Kong Country inspiration within this Mm -hmm. gameplay. It just hadn't really been done in this type of visual environment. Exactly. Taking it from that side scroll 2D to a full 3D. Yeah, you see the crates, even though that was like thought of as like, what else do we include? It's very reminiscent to the barrels of Donkey Kong Country, especially like one, two, and three of either saving your partner, having bananas in them, just using them to kill enemies. So there's a variation that really was attributed to that. In roughly half of the game's levels, certain crates contain tokens in the likeness of Tana. Cortex, or his assistant, Nitrous Brio. Collecting three tokens of a single character will transport Crash to a bonus round, where he must break crates in a side-scrolling area. Falling off the screen during a bonus round will not cost the player a life, but will send Crash back to the point in the level he was transported from. A few levels contain bonus rounds for two different characters. Tana's bonus rounds are designed to be the easiest and most plentiful, and clearing one enables the player to save their game. Brio's bonus rounds are more difficult, featuring more TNT crates and requiring more precise jumps. Cortex's bonus rounds are the most difficult and are only included in two levels. Clearing Cortex's bonus rounds grants Crash a key that unlocks a secret level. Clearing a level without losing a life and after breaking all its crates, excluding crates and bonus rounds, will grant Crash a gem, which will be displayed by the level's name on the map screen. If the player clears a level in one life without breaking all the crates, a screen displays the amount of crates that were missed. And if the player loses any lives over the course of the level, they will instead be sent directly to the map screen upon the level's completion. While most gems are clear and colorless, six colored gems enable Crash to access areas in previous levels that he was not able to reach before. Collecting all 26 gems unlocks a special epilogue sequence accessible from the game's penultimate or second to last level. And this was sort of this generation's games version of the, I, I want to say like achievements or trophies where it's just that little extra challenge to give the game a little bit more life, some maybe some longevity as well. And I'm glad that games of this era decided to implement things like that because Crash and games like it, you could be, be done with. It's over. You know, you think of like Mario 64, you don't need to get every single star in order to defeat Bowser and save Princess Peach. Sure. But if you decide to do that, you get the little secret Yoshi that comes down and you get to see Yoshi in Mario 64. It's not really that exciting. I've done it. But it is something that when you're a kid, you're like, hey, this is cool. And it just gives me a little bit more of a reason to go and do this. And it rewards the player for doing that replayability for going back in and being a completionist and and beating it all. And even if it's nominal, like the Yoshi thing and a couple other things, it's it's cool that you have it. It's nominal. And even with this, it just shows you a full cutscene of everything else that's after the game. It is really cool. And like you said, it was, you know, the first generation of gaming or second generation of gaming, however you want to say it's way of achievements and led into that of like wanting to collect all the fruit, wanting to get all the gems and perfect it to get not only the achievements and later things or trophies, but to also like feel that accomplishment. So let's talk about the story of Crash. Somewhere southeast of Australia rests three little islands teeming with wildlife. On one of these islands resides Dr. Neo Cortex, who along with his assistant, Dr. Nitrous Brio, are trying to create an animal army known as the Cortex Commandos to achieve world domination. Crash Bandicoot, a peaceful bandicoot, is slated to become the army's general. Dr. Enbrio has created a machine known as the Evolve Array, which is capable of giving animals anthropomorphic traits. 
Dr. Cortex eventually subjects these creatures to the Cortex Vortex, a device designed to brainwash animals and make them obedient to him. Despite Dr. Brio's warning that the Cortex was unstable, Cortex rushed the newly evolved Crash into the Vortex, which rejects him. Crash then seizes the opportunity to escape, with Cortex in pursuit. He eventually breaks through a window and escapes by falling into the sea. Cortex orders that the second bandicoot he caught be prepared for the vortex, Tana, Crash's girlfriend. And Crash washes up on the beach of his home island and sets out to save Tana before Cortex can use the vortex on her. There, Crash meets a floating tiki mask known as a kuku, who provides Crash with assistance in the form of masks that will take damage for him. Cortex decides that Crash must be stopped before he can return for Tana and sends out his best henchmen after him. Cortex's plan is foiled when Crash reaches his toxic waste factory wherein Cortex's machinery is powered and shuts it down during a battle with Cortex's top minion, Pinstripe Potoru. Crash soon enters Cortex's sinister castle where he confronts Embryo in his lab room. The mad doctor drinks a potion to turn himself into a monster pounding the ground which causes the castle to go up in flames. With his plans ruined, Cortex faces Crash atop his airship. Crash eventually gains the upper hand and manages to destroy Cortex's hoverboard, causing the doctor to seemingly fall to his death. Crash is finally reunited with his beloved Tana. The couple take the airship and fly into the sunset. It's a beautiful little story, and simplistic for this. This really isn't a story-driven game, but I think a decent story enough to be like, hey, Tried this thing, rejected, now we have the princess in the castle, basically. And yeah, and you never see her again. Very James Bond. Crash Bond? Mm -hmm. Crash Bondicoot. Crash Bondicoot. All right, I love it. Coin it. We're going to coin it. We're also going to coin the alternate ending. The game also features an alternate ending, which can only occur after gaining 100% completion. If Crash collects all the gems and follows the path which appears in the Great Hall, Crash finds Tana waiting for him on the balcony. Crash and Tana escape together on a friendly vulture, and the epilogue is as follows. Papu Papu started a big and tall shop using money he received by selling Cortex Castle to a resort developer. Ripper Roo received intense therapy, and a few years later of higher education, wrote the book Through the Eyes of the Vortex, pondering the consequences of rapid evolution. Koala Kong moved to Hollywood, started an acting career, and is working with a speech therapist to improve his diction. Pinstripe moved to Chicago and started a sanitation company. Dr. Embryo revisited his early hobby of bartending. Dr. Cortex is said to have disappeared. His whereabouts were unknown, but it led to an idea for Crash Bandicoot 2. <laughs> I love that. That's such a dumb, fun ending of like all the bosses just being like, you know what? My time as Dr. Embryo is now going back behind the bar. <laughs> Come get a drink. Yeah, it's uh, definitely a very cliched ending in a way. You know, it's the Goodfellas ending or whatever, mm -hmm. except a more positive ending for everyone, uh, with the exception of probably of Cortex. But he will have his day in Crash Bandicoot too, of course. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really stands out to me, I think, about this game is the music, the soundtrack. It's very unique. It's, it's instantly recognizable. It reminds me a lot of the Donkey Kong Country soundtrack yes. in some ways. The music for Crash Bandicoot was a last-minute aspect added to the game before it's showing at E3. Siller proposed that rather than conventional music, Gavin could create an urban chaotic symphony where random sound effects such as bird vocalizations, vehicle horns, grunts, and flatulence would be combined, of course. Gotta have that gas. After Naughty Dog rejected this proposal, Siller introduced them to the music production company Mutado Muzika and its founder Mark Mothersbaugh. According to Siller, Mutado Muzika joined production after speaking with Siller without Naughty Dog being consulted, which resulted in an angry confrontation between Ruben and Siller. Cerny removed Siller from production following this incident. So, pretty serious. Mm -hmm. The music was composed by Josh Mansell and produced by Baggett. Mansell's initial tracks for the game were manic and hyperactive before Baggett directed him toward more ambient compositions. The sound effects were created by Mike Gollum, Ron Horwitz, and Kevin Spears of Universal Sound Studios. 
The sound of Ripper Roo's maniacal chortling is a sample of a hyena voiced by Dallas McKennan from the 1955 film Lady and the Tramp. The voice acting was provided by Brendan O'Brien, who came in contact with Ruben through Pearson and recorded his dialogue below the Universal Studio Lots Hitchcock Theater. The rejected hand-drawn animated intro featured a theme song performed by Jim Cummings. Interesting. So a really kind of odd process for, you know, music that was kind of thought of as like an aside or something that wasn't a part of it to really make an impact on what's actually happening and like firings, removals, people being here and there. It's kind of an interesting way that finally come up with this summarization of mostly sounds, but some, some great beats. And like you said, very reminiscent of the Donkey Kong Country era, which in and of itself is such an iconic soundtrack. Absolutely. And I find this intro track that they were trying to include Jim Cummings in, that would have been a lot of fun. If you don't know, he's done a ton of voice acting work. He's Winnie the Pooh. He's the Tasmanian Devil, Darkwing Duck, all kinds of just very iconic voices of of animated characters. So would have been cool. But again, you can still check that out on YouTube. Upload it there. It's worth a check. In and out over the checkout. <laughs> now, we talked about it earlier on and kind of glanced on it, but let's dive into the Japanese distribution of Crash Bandicoot. In preparation for presenting Crash Bandicoot to Sony's Japanese division, Gavin spent a month studying anime and manga, reading English language books on the subject, watching Japanese films, and observing competitive characters in video games. Upon Naughty Dog's first meeting with the executives of Sony Computer Entertainment Japan, The executives handed Naughty Dog a document that compared Crash with Mario and Knights into Dreams, another fantastic game. Although Crash was rated favorably in the graphics department, the main character and the game's non-Japanese heritage were seen as weak points. The renderings of the character made specifically for the meeting also proved unimpressive. During a break following the initial meeting, Gavin approached Charlotte Francis, the artist responsible for the renderings, and gave her 15 minutes to adjust Crash's facial features. Sony Japan bought Crash for Japanese distribution after being showed the modified printout. Again, that very much fly by the seat of your pants, like, hey, we got a quick, like, recess right now, redraw Crash. Talk about being clutch. Yeah. And so the Japanese version of Crash Bandicoot was made easier than the original release to appeal to the Japanese PlayStation market's preference for lower difficulty levels. The localization hid the game's American origins as much as possible, featuring no Roman letters, for instance. Pop-up text instructions given by Aku Aku were added for the Japanese versions of the game. Some of the game's music was changed at the request of Sony's Japanese division to be less edgy. A screen in which Crash is struck by falling crates, the player had missed in a level, so that's at the end, it goes bonk, 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 was altered after the Japanese children testing the game reported being disturbed and upset by this image. You imagine just a a little kid sitting there watching Crash get hit and they just burst into tears. They just lose it. A death animation in which Crash is reduced to a pair of eyeballs and shoes following an explosion was omitted due to its resemblance to the modus operandi or basically the kind of like calling card of a serial killer loose in Japan at the time. So they're like, hey, yeah, we've got a guy going around pulling eyeballs and shoes off. Um, can we not have that in the game? Because that's real. That's, uh, <laughs> Could you imagine that? That's fair. Hey, so yeah, uh, just by coincidence, there is a guy running around yanking out eyeballs. Let's not. Yeah, let's just, let's just not. And so the Japanese television advertising campaign for Crash Bandicoot included a dance performed by a costume Crash Bandicoot mascot. The dance was created by Sony Japan's marketing manager, Megumi Hosoya. The advertisement's background music became the opening theme for the Japanese versions of subsequent Crash Bandicoot games, and the success of the campaign influenced Naughty Dog to incorporate the dance into the games. Crash Bandicoot was released in Japan on December 9th, 1996. It was later re-released as part of the Best for Family range on May 28th, 1998, 
and the PS1 books release followed on October 12th, 2001. Oh, an interesting story that I guess shouldn't have been, but is wild to like, yeah, yeah, we'll just send this game to Japan, just port it for the PlayStation. Oh, you guys have a serial killer and we have to rearrange pretty much everything in the game. Got it. I find localization stuff in video games so interesting because it really is, it, it changes so many fundamentals about these games in ways that you may not ever possibly recognize, you will never know mm-hmm. about. And so from everything to just translation being done by individuals influencing this game for the masses to things like this, where animations have to be changed entirely because of certain things going on uh, in the news at the time or just small sample sizes of kids from different cultures. It's really interesting how that can impact a game to that level. Especially in a time where like, we are so, especially media-wise, westernized now towards everything so like even localizations are getting rid of either some traditional things or just overlooking them at times and we only see it in the news as a censorship issue especially looking at china and some russian things a couple other things with those so it's interesting to see like how those cultural impacts have shifted with more western media becoming prevalent kind of all over and with that i think that's a great segue into how did people perceive this game Crash Bandicoot was a commercial success. The game was the second highest renting PlayStation title at Blockbuster Video in its opening month. You really are pushing my nostalgia button. You're, you're tickling I told you, me. It's, it's all nostalgia all day, baby. The game was the second highest renting PlayStation title at Blockbuster Video in its opening month before topping the chart the following month and staying within top 10 for two subsequent months. By late February 1998, its sales in the United States reached 1.5 million units, while Japanese and European sales reached 610 and 725,000 units, respectively. Crash Bandicoot was the first non-Japanese game to receive a gold prize in Japan for sales of over 500,000 units. And as of November 2003, Crash Bandicoot has sold over 6.8 million units worldwide, making it one of the best-selling PlayStation video games of all time and the highest-selling ranked on sales in the United States. Crash Bandicoot received generally favorable reviews from critics with Electronic Gaming Monthly and GameFan rewarding it the Game of the Month title. The visuals were singled out for praise, with critics declaring them to be the best yet seen on a fifth-generation console. Particular notice was given to the shaded textures, colorful and detailed backgrounds, lighting and shadows, smooth animation, and special effects such as flames and water transparency. However, Nabosa Radakovich of Game Revolution felt that the shading was almost too well done, claiming that it made the game more difficult by making the pits appear to be shadows and vice versa. The game's visual style was compared to a cartoon, with Tommy Glide of GamePro noting that Crash's death animations lend a Warner Brothers flair. Crash was welcomed as a character for his quirky design and mannerisms, although Glide considered the enemy designs to be tame. So overall, not too much. I do agree on that point of like missing pits sometimes because they kind of creep up on you when you're like walking. You're like, I I thought I made that gap or like, ooh, I did not think that was a pit. So I can get that that kind of disclaimer of like sometimes it was was it's too good. I felt too enthralled into the shadows, those lights and darks. I squinted too much while I played this game. (laughs) I mean, that was the issue. Maybe early on when they were doing all the art and squinting, they just squinted for too long. They're like, oh, man. (laughs) I missed it. Now it's too colorful. So just a couple more asides to give you some more info with Crash. Dark Horse Books reprinted the original developer's Bible for Crash Bandicoot as a hardcover publication titled The Crash Bandicoot Files. How Willy the Wombat Sparked Marsupial Mania, which was released on March 27th, 2018. Crash Bandicoot became a speedrunner's paradise, with over 180 entries in the Any% percent category and over 70 in the 100% percent category. In Any% percent, Burgerlands 2 tops the leaderboard with a 39 minute 52 second finish, and Tebit underscore W holds the top spot in 100% percent with a time of one hour, two minutes, and 28 seconds. That is insane. Insane trilogy. Um, that is Ooh. insane for people to be able to do that. And I, 
am like envious, but also don't envy at all what speedrunners go through to like produce these things. It's just so much fun to watch. There is a fine line between I really love this game, I'm good at it, and I could beat it pretty quick to I am going to absolutely dominate this game from beginning to end because I know all the ins and outs and the secrets. And it really is fascinating to watch the level of effort that people put into figuring out the secrets of these games to speed run them. Oh, yeah. I just... Eh, probably last year watched the crash bandicoot one and it's amazing to see like oh yeah if you hit the jump perfectly and kind of touch the edge of the side of the level you move like two pixels more which makes it available to dodge that jump without having to do like a like a, a jump here and a jump there you can make like one jump and they're like yeah it shaves off 0.3 seconds and i'm like this is you guys are insane like the effort put into like shaving minimal time off this whole thing. I'm stressed out just thinking about it. Can you imagine doing that and then just making one small mistake after you if you're putting in that level of detail mm -hmm. and you just make one small mistake and miss it. It's like, man, I know that I could do better. I could do this perfectly. That oh, I have anxiety just thinking about it. It's it's wild. That's why I don't speed run. I barely even slow run games. <laughs> <laughs> and so finally, the Crash Bandicoot series established Naughty Dog's reputation in the video game industry. And they found further success with the likes of Jack and Daxter, Uncharted, and The Last of Us series becoming basically the empire of Sony, the empire of the PlayStation, the empire of every game that you all have pretty much known or played that has a platforming style. They're the grandpapa, the grandmama, the grand dog of pretty much everything that's out there that Sony kind of touches. Yeah, obviously their influence on Sony is very, very large. I mean, and now they're getting into the film industry as well. You know, Uncharted's there. Jack mm -hmm. and Daxter had a film as well, did it not? I believe that it did. It did, had a cartoony film. Last of Us having a film come out. So our series, whichever one it is, but it's, it's amazing what it is. No. Crash Bandicoot, as the official, unofficial mascot for Sony, I mean, Mario's got multiple movies. Where's the, is there a Crash hey. Bandicoot movie? Where's, where's my Chris Pratt? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I cannot wait for that. But anyway, so yeah, it's, it's amazing to see what's happened with this. And not only that, like a couple different tidbits. So Cerny, who we've been talking about with Universal, actually went on to head the development of the PS4 and the PS Vita. Oh, wow. So he actually made the Sony shift as well from Universal, and I, I guarantee Naughty Dog's a little bit to thank for that. Yeah. Thanks, Cerny. I enjoy your work. I had a lot of fun with the PlayStation 4, sir. Such a great time. And so that was our coverage of Crash Bandicoot, and not only that, the birth of basically the PlayStation. And as always, Derek, why did we choose this game? What do you think of it? I mean, I feel like you just kind of said it. It's obviously just meant a lot, I think, to people who own the PlayStation consoles where there wasn't necessarily a very clear mascot. And it's not to say that a console necessarily needs a mascot. It just needs good IPs. It needs originality. It needs characters that can be instantly recognizable. It needs branding, essentially. And Crash Bandicoot really became that for Sony and for the PlayStation. And while I myself don't necessarily love Crash the same level that I loved Sonic or the same level that I love Mario. Sure. I do know a lot of people who are at, like I said at the beginning of the episode, there are a lot of people out there whose avatars on my PlayStation friend list are still Crash Bandicoot. They still play the Crash games. They still have a lot of fun with this character. And it really, I think, Crash encapsulated a lot of what 90s culture was, where Sonic is very similar to me in terms of that sort of weird edginess but i also think they've sort of changed him over time to be a little bit less like that where crash bandicoot mm -hmm. is still just you know your rebellious bandicoot so it's a very cool game i like the 3d-ness i like the concepts it's hard in the gameplay to really differentiate the in-game mechanics necessarily from the stuff that maybe you would see in a donkey kong country game Sure. Now, the 3D aspects and the, the rail camera, I do feel like that was a very unique and a, a good take on the game. Sonic's ass game, definitely a very interesting concept to start with. I'm going to give this game a rating of 6 out of 10. I just didn't 
feel like this game was a little bit after me. If I had played this game when it first came out, not after me, this game's a little bit before me. If I had played this game when it first came out, I would have been very, very young. And Mm -hmm. I don't think I really would have been able to appreciate it in the way that it needed appreciated. But by the time that I could play this game, there were other games out there. There was a Mario 64 out there for me. That was really the first 3D platformer in my world. And I love that game so much. So when I finally did go back and play Crash, I was kind of like, man, some of these textures make it hard to move around. I I think the pitfall is an absolute valid thing. The camera Mm -hmm. angles not being able to move that stuff around in the ways that you want to sometimes make the game frustrating to play in ways that it doesn't necessarily have to be. And for things like that, I'm going to stick with the six. What about you? Wholeheartedly agree on that, especially, you know, you and I being the same age with this and growing up, this was not really a game made for kids. The PlayStation wasn't really a kid's console overall in the, the North American release. I mean, when you have Full Metal, you've got Spyro, which is somewhat a kid's game, but just as difficult in some of the platforming aspects as Crash Bandicoot. These were definitely games made for a challenge to Nintendo, but I don't know if in the same way as an audience range, but to get people onto that Sony realm. Even today, there's very, very few Sony games that are specifically kid-targeted, whereas Nintendo, that's pretty much their whole catalog, minus maybe 10 to 15% of it. And so playing Crash the same way, like you said, it was difficult as a kid. Like you don't have like those like sweet gamer reflexes you get when you're older and have played a bunch of games to like know the ins and outs of how to do this. You just kept dying and dying and dying and dying. Wasn't that fun. However, and I I should note, I mean, just on that, that I got Super Mario 64 just a a little bit later than the time that it came out because they came out Mm -hmm. in a very similar time frame. But like by the time I even got into PlayStation games, and I agree with you wholeheartedly that I think looking back, it felt more like an adult console than a Nintendo console did at the time. So definitely a a big, big factor in the way that I view Crash. And that's the way I view Sony for a lot of it. I think missing out on the PS1, which which is still around for a while, like we were still old enough to kind of play it. It just had more of those adult games at Grand Theft Auto. Like it had these adult games that were more meant for that. So if, if you had grown up in the 80s, let's say, and then jumped onto this console, this probably would have been the one for you. If you didn't want to play those kids game or the Nintendo stuff or, you know, get off of all the Sega and Atari and Amiga stuff like that, you could jump to this. So as far as like a franchise bender or a challenger or an establisher, Crash is way up there. It established the PlayStation. It established the unofficial official mascot. And we even see it today. When, when Spyro was re-released, when Crash was re-released, people went crazy. Like, these were like, this was my childhood. So I think for everybody, it's a bit different. If that's the console, you know, your, your, maybe your dad or your brother bought and you played with them and, like, that was your thing that you played, I can see you jumping back into that. So if I had to give it a rating, I would give it a booga booga, um, multiply that by the amazing time you get when you actually do get three Aku Aku masks and just run through stuff. Um, subtract out that every time you get it, I usually just fell in a hole automatically, so it didn't really matter that I was invincible. I just would kill myself on accident. Uh, (laughs) um, Add in the first time, I believe, we really get that like forward-facing character with the boulder rush, um, but also making it one of the hardest snap reflexes levels ever to be created because you had 0.2 seconds to jump over a barrier or jump over a pit onto a tiny platform over another pit onto like ground, which is insane. Multiply it by the insane trilogy, which is a great name um, with it. And then also subtract out that everyone has made a Mario Kart clone looking at you, Crash Nitro or whatever the hell you're called. Um, And probably put that out of really wanting to take a bite out of a Wumper Fruit out of 10. Forgot about that game. I think Mm -hmm. that should bring the score down a little bit. Oh, it did. Let me tell you, it did not that. It, it definitely did. Um, but yeah, that was, again, our summary, our deal on Crash Bandicoot. Research for this episode was done by Alex. He's trying to tickle me in the nostalgia button all day long. That's my full name, uh, by the way. The intro and outro music for this episode was composed, recorded by our friend Evan Barr. And if you all didn't know, this episode was actually selected by our patrons. 
So if you are not part of our Patreon, we have perks, you know, like be able to choose where the show goes, what episodes we do. And not only that, exclusive shirts, exclusive merch, exclusive stickers, a D&D session we're doing, a Minecraft server plus other servers we're creating as well. Not only that, an amazing Discord community. So if you want to be a part of that, Check it out at patreon.com slash finish the fight. You get all that stuff for just $5? All that stuff starting at the five buckaroonies, and it goes up from there depending on what physical perks you want, as well as a couple of the other digital ones, such as having your name read here. And we will start with Tactics, Sky the Bear, Grant Dillon, Mr. Choff, Trace, Mega, Nick Hyman, Richard Scanlon, McChief, Climbing Spork, Mr. 1898, William Kroll, and Mr. Toot. So again, thank you all for the support. And if you guys have any questions, hit us up. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter. You can also join our Discord. It's free to join. Alex and I are over there having a lot of fun. It's where we get and give most of the news about the podcast. Uh, we get feedback there. Love hanging out with everyone. It's a good time. Join us up. Absolutely. And if you want to check us out on our socials our channels where you can see us check us out over on twitch uh you can check me out at twitch.tv slash sourman70 that's s-o-u-r-m-a-n-7-0 as well as derek over at twitch.tv slash the baker man 24 7 that is the baker man 247 you can find us on itunes spotify or most likely your favorite podcast listening platform if you haven't yet please leave us a review helps us out a lot we love hearing from you guys and we'd love to hear any more and again this has been Crash Bandicoot. What did you think of it? Did you play it when you were growing up? Have you played it on the Insane Trilogy? Would you say that Crash is the best mascot out there? <laughs> or not? <laughs> Let us know. Um, love you guys. As always, I am your host, Alex Kendall. And I am your host, Derek Baker. And this has been Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. <laughs>